I'd like to introduce you today to Dr. Anthea Senior, who teaches radiology at the Dental School at the University of Alberta. And this is the first in a series of videos in which he gives tips and tricks that help us to get through those little frustrations in everyday practice with regard to radiology. And Dr. Senior has worked for many years in general practice. Welcome, Anthea. Thanks, John. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, I'd just like to share some tips and tricks on radiographic technique today. Um, when we first went digital a couple of years ago here at University of Alberta, we were finding that some of the images that we got with our direct sensors just weren't quite as good as what we've been getting with film and PSP plates. So we did a bit of troubleshooting and after a while we discovered that really you can get really particularly great bite wing images with a direct sensor as well as with film and PSP plates. And I think you've got a presentation you want to show us. Yes, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Lovely. So let's look at some tricks and tips for taking bite wings with direct digital sensors. As we all know, bite wing radiographs are the most common images that are taken throughout the world, particularly in general practice settings. And they're used for many reasons, some reasons I've listed here. They're particularly useful for the detection of interproximal caries, particularly early lesions, that it's very difficult to see clinically in between the teeth. They're used to monitor the progression of caries. They're used to assess existing restorations. And they're also often used to assess the periodontal status, particularly for looking at the crestal and the alveolar bone levels. So here we can see that we've got some horizontal bite wings and we've also got some vertical bite wings. Vertical bite wings are indicated when clinical probing depths are above six millimeters. And really for those patients where we expect that there has been some advanced bone loss. So what do I mean when I say a good bite wing image? Here are some good bite wings that were taken with film on the top here and with PSP plates on the bottom. You'll see that usually in most patients who have all their teeth, it's necessary to take both a premolar and a molar bite wing on each side. What are the landmarks that we're looking for on a perfect bite wing? We want all the contacts of both the maxillary and mandibular teeth to be open. And we particularly want both the maxillary and the mandibular bone levels to be clearly seen. Ideally, we want the distal surface of the most distal fully erupted tooth to be present. And on the premolar view, we particularly want to see the canine to premolar contact on both the top and the bottom. So why is it so important to see this canine first premolar contact on bite wing images? Let's look at a full mouth series here, just to try and explain this. So on our full mouth series, you'll see that in the canine periapical regions, so here and here and here and here, what often happens because of the curve of the dental arch is that we get overlapping of the three, four contact. So you can see that in these areas, it's very, very difficult to see the bone level. And also it would be very difficult to see any early pathology going on. This is why when we take a premolar bite wing that we particularly want to see that 3-4 contact. Another reason that we want to see the distal surface of the canine on the premolar bite wing image is that it is a useful guide when positioning the receptor intraorally as to how far forwards in the patient's mouth to position the receptor. If we place the receptor far enough forwards to see the canine premolar contact, like we have here in this mixed dentition bite wing, you'll see that a lot of the molar contacts and the first permanent molar contact tends to open up a little bit more than it can sometimes be open on the molar view, even if the molar bite wing was really taken quite well. So in other words, by bringing the sensor far enough forwards to get at least the distal surface of the canine, it often improves the contact points in the other teeth. So this was the problem whenever we first used direct digital sensors. 
Direct digital sensors are sometimes called solid state sensors as well. One of the great advantages of them over plates and certainly film are that you know you get the instant image on the screen. So they're very, very popular and widely used both in general practice, specialist practices and in school settings. But here are some of the frustrations that we encountered whenever we first used direct sensors. On the right side, premolar and molar views here, you can see that there's a large gap between the teeth. As the patient is not biting completely together onto the bite block. Hence, we're certainly not seeing any, if much, maxillary bone on the right hand side. Also, if you look on the premolar images, the distal of the canine, and indeed, lots of the first premolars, particularly on the bottom, are not visible at all. Also, there's a lot of overlapping of the molar contacts, both on the molar view and on the premolar views. So, basically not great bite wings, so let's explore what went wrong and how we could prevent these errors from happening. So the first error that I pointed out was that the patient wasn't closing together completely onto the bite block. And this is a very common error with a direct sensor. And it's often to do with the extra width or bulk of a direct sensor compared to conventional film or PSP plates. On this slide here, you can see a phosphorus plate here and you can see how thin it is compared to a variety of sensors that are often used today. We were also missing the canine area on the premolar bite wing images because the receptor was not brought far enough forwards. And this can be possible in some patients, especially with those with a shallow floor of the mouth, a square shaped arch, or tori anatomical constraints, those kind of things. The other thing that happened was that when we use direct sensors, we're also getting less coverage of the anatomical area of interest as unlike PSP plates and film with a direct sensor, there's a protective casing around the circuitry that means that that area of the sensor is not active. So we don't get as much coverage clinically as we do with film and PSP plates. So because of the bulk of the sensor and the fact that all of the sensor area that we're seeing is not active to the x-rays, we need to kind of troubleshoot and come up with a way that we can get our direct sensors to work and give us the images just as well as PSP plates and foam. So let's have a look at how we can do this. Here are a few suggestions. The first is to always place a direct sensor in the floor of the mouth towards the midline and not right up beside the lingual surface of the mandibular teeth as shown here. So instead of placing the sensor right beside the lingual surface here, place it much more towards the midline of the floor of the mouth. Careful placement parallel to the teeth and a little bit away from the teeth will enable most patients to close completely together and comfortably to take the molar bite wing. You can always check that the patient is closing completely together by getting them to close on the bite block and then asking them to smile but still keeping their teeth together. And it's really important that you don't expose the image and take the image unless you're sure that the patient is biting right on the bite block. The second fix is to purposefully angle the direct sensor when taking particularly the premolar images. So on the left side here, you can see that when you use film and PSP plates, because they are much thinner, they can easily be moved forwards enough in the mouth to capture the canine premolar contact. However, it changes whenever we use the direct sensor because of the extra bulk. And often there's a not enough room in the floor of the mouth to bring the sensor far enough forwards here for the patient to close together. Hence, what you need to do is angle the sensor like this towards the canine of the opposite side of the arch. Not only will this enable you to detect bone loss and caries in this area, but by moving the sensor forwards, you often get opening of those maxillary molar contacts that we discussed earlier. 
However, one of the challenges is if we now line up the beam indicating device directly with the aiming ring, there needs to be a slight distal horizontal adjustment of the BID like this. This adjustment enables the horizontal x-rays to go directly through the contact points and the overlapping is reduced. So basically because we have not placed the direct sensor parallel to the teeth, we need to make this slight adjustment of how we line the BID so that we get the rays going through the contacts and minimize overlapping. A further video illustrating this can be found on the OASIS website. So by making these simple adjustments, it is possible to obtain the perfect premolar and molar bite wing images using a direct sensor in most, if not all, patients. So just to summarize, place the direct digital sensor further away from the teeth than you would with film or PSP plates. If the patient cannot close together onto the bite block, reposition it until they can. If they still can't close together, stop and think. Try using a different holder or receptor. You could switch to a PSP plate or a film if they're available, or sometimes go to a smaller size of direct sensor, such as a size one direct sensor, and position it vertically rather than horizontally. To obtain the three to four contact on premolar bite wings, angle the direct sensor to the other side of the arch and adjust the horizontal angulation. I hope these tips help. Thank you very much for that presentation, Anthea. Are you um, prepared to take further questions from colleagues uh, about this topic area and others that they uh, identify that they're having frustrations with? Absolutely, John. I'd be delighted to do that. And, you know, I, I think it's important that we realize that just with some little tips and tricks, some of the common frustrations that we kind of encounter every day in practice, if we just kind of share these, it can make a big difference. So I'd be happy for any feedback, any questions. That's lovely. Look forward to the next uh, video with you, Anthea. Thanks very much, John.